This is Cher, and I'm here with Jason and Rob. Guys, if you had to describe this podcast in five words or less, what would you say? I'm going to go with Wild E. Coyote guzzling gasoline. I'm thinking climate change diarrhea hurricane. <laughs> Are you serious? Maybe I should do this thing on my own. Fine. It's a show about how to stay sane in a world where there's too many people consuming too much stuff and the planet can't take it anymore. You had me at diarrhea. Caution. If you're allergic to four-letter words, you might want to try a different podcast. Hey, Rob and Jason, I want to tell you guys about this email I got today. Uh, Okay. So I got an email from somebody who was asking me if I had heard about this thing, solar roadways. I have. Are you guys (laughs) familiar with this? Oh, yeah. It it rings a little bell, but... All uh, right, well, let me... me me Yeah, let me refresh your memory, okay? Solar freaking roadways. What are they? They're solar freaking roadways. What do they want from me? Well, they're solar freaking roadways. Okay, so actually this time, what is it? It's technology that replaces all roadways, parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, tarmacs, bike paths, and outdoor recreation surfaces with solar panels. And not just lifeless, boring solar panels. Smart, microprocessing, interlocking, hexagonal solar units. No more useless asphalt and concrete just sitting there baking in the sun, needing to be repaved, and filling with potholes that ruin your axle alignment on your sweet rad, bro. So... That's good. So uh, this guy uh, asked what? me, "Do you have you heard about these solar roadways?" And I thought, "Wait, we're still talking about this?" Thing? Right, right. So this for folks who don't know, I don't know, 4 or 5 years ago or something like that, there was this like viral video that that came out. It was being passed around certainly in our circles a lot, talking about this cool new invention which is basically a way of putting solar panels down on a, on a surface under glass that we could drive on, right? So, like, instead of driving on asphalt, we'd be driving on solar panels. And yeah. the solar panels would do all these amazing things, you know? I, like I'm still not getting past the uh, way that thing was delivered. Won't ruin your sweet ride, bro! Hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked, okay? Because, so they did this Indiegogo campaign, right? Sure. And they set out to, like, raise a million bucks. They raised almost two and a half million dollars, right? People were like throwing, you know, just pulling out loose change and throwing out. Anytime somebody talks fast and says, bro, I give them as much money as I can. (laughs) Totally. Bro directly correlates to a solid business plan. Oh, wait, wait. Here's they're they're like flat on the uh, flat on the ground. Yeah, yeah, okay. this is all, they're basically talking about replacing yeah, all the roads in the United States and they even talked about, you know, parking garages and other things. Too, I mean, right? on the equator you want stuff basically level with the ground, but oh. you know, where I live, it's 45 degree angle is the optimum. Oh, orientation. you're going to start in with geometry stuff, I'm huh, sorry, bro? I'm just immediately run to issues. <laughs> right, so that, that that's the reason I brought it up, okay. right? So this 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 idea, you know, people they they toss out this idea, did this campaign, people threw millions of dollars at them to do this thing. And if you just like scratch at the surface a tiny little bit, you realize yeah, you scratch this doesn't panel. make any goddamn sense. Think, think of all right. the jobs you'll create cleaning the glass as it gets dirty. It's going to be great. It, it could be like uh, Jason, you play tennis. It'll be like the the ball boy or ball girl. They got to like run out between cars and wipe down the glass. I've never had one of those help me out with tennis. I'd like one of those. <laughs> yeah, well. I will. Thank I'll you. volunteer. Right, I'll let you yeah. know my nest tennis. Okay. So you, Jason, you went immediately to one of the you know the 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 easy criticisms of this idea. You're going to put down solar panels flat on the ground, right? Which is kind of suboptimal. In fact, yeah, I think you lose about sixty percent, you know, okay. of of, of the I... efficiency of the solar panels when you lay them flat like that instead of tilted. Now we all know I come from a place of ignorance, but can I just ask: Is it safe to drive on glass? That doesn't seem particularly. <laughs> well, so safe the whole idea here was this is like incredibly durable glass. You know, it's kind of a bit of a rough surface, so you don't slip on it. Okay. Um, okay. Of course, you've got this very thick glass on top of solar panels. That's right. going to reduce your efficiency even more. Even more, right? right. So you got a flat. You got it like underneath yeah, all etched, this glass, so it's like, like rough. Oh, yeah. yeah, totally. And then what about all the debris? You know, it gets covered by dirt. It gets covered by leaves. It gets, yeah. gets covered by What happens whatever. when a, like a snow plow comes by and has to scrape it Well, clean. no, so these guys oh. argued. They said, you don't even need snow plows anymore okay. because Talk they've got me. heating units inside. They're, they had this the whole vision where 
<laughs> all of these solar panels, they're they're hex, he, hexagonal shape. Blah, sure. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I can't even say that. Six sided. Yeah. And and <laughs> they have all these LED lights in them, right? So you could change the patterns. You can even have words show up on these. Bro, you know, you each change. hexagon comes with its own elf that cleans it off. And and heating units, right? So they can melt the snow in places. Think about this, yeah. right? So not only are these solar panels flat, yeah. right? But you're talking about in places at, at – Yeah, Wisconsin. You know, yeah, exactly, where <laughs> there's a lot of snow. You're not going to get a lot of sun in the in the, it's uh, be hard. In the winter time, right? right. But, uh, but apparently the idea is they would have heating units associated with them so you can melt all the snow. Oh. You wouldn't need snow plows anymore, It'd right? It would be awesome, too. You can just live on them. You can lie down. It would be like getting a massage. Yeah, you, know? you, don't, need, you don't need the snow plows. You don't. In fact, they were talking about burying transmission lines, fiber optics lines, all this stuff. Was it cheap? I mean, you know, was the idea that this would like save money and stuff? You right. Know? Well, so because you're not you're, you're paving. You're not you're stacking functions. You're not just paving a road. You're creating energy. Right. So uh, this guy is actually a great video online of somebody who sort of did a reality check on this idea. And one of the things he pointed out was. You know, if you replaced all of the road surfaces in the United States, it's like something like 25,000 square miles That's of roads. That's uh, not too bad. That's that, that right there is an unbelievable number. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of roads 25,000 square miles That's not, that's not bad. That's of so, roads. But his point was, hey, if we replaced all that asphalt with solar panels, we could generate three times the electricity that we consume in the United States. But this, so this other guy kind of ran some, some of the math, and he basically figured out, well, yeah, but just the glass, just the glass, okay. right? Forget all the other components, the solar panels, all the wiring, all the other stuff. Forget the labor, any sure. of that stuff. Just the glass, $20 trillion. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Wow. So will it save money? Good, yeah. good question. Well, the cool thing would be if you had an aquarium style, right? Like you had fish swimming in there too. Can we, can we get that? Sure. That, that wouldn't cause accidents, people staring <laughs> down at the fish. Or you could watch movies maybe yeah. as, you, as hey, you're driving by. Brilliant. I think somebody trialed these things, right? Wasn't there some demo where they didn't do so hot? Or? Right. So, yeah. So the folks that did this Indiegogo campaign, I think that they're doing small scale stuff wherever. They're actually somewhere in the Midwest, okay? But the other people have taken this idea and they're trying to do these experiments in different places. So in France, they've been doing this experiment on a relatively small number uh, distance of road. And unfortunately, what they've discovered was that the solar panels are producing half the amount of electricity that they that they thought that they would, mm -hmm. right? So they're they're not very efficient, they're not very productive. Yeah. And these guys, you know, with this the solar roadways, the, the video we listened to or the, the audio that we listened to, they basically admitted that the just the LED lights would consume most of the, the electricity <laughs> so, you know that would be produced. So let let me get this straight. Just because you put the word freaking in the middle of it, it doesn't work. Is that is that basically sum it up? But my point here, maybe that's a good question. But my point here is not so much making fun of this idea. It's more the fact that we see these kinds of things all oh, the time. Oh, there are a dime a dozen. Yeah. They come across my inbox all the time, and, and there are people legitimately asking questions like, is this a real thing? You know, have we figured out something here? You know, my, I think my nickname probably, you know, maybe they don't tell, people don't tell this to me to my face, but my nickname is probably Mr. Wet Blanket. <laughs> because you know how many times people ask me that kind of sure. that, there's one thing after I'm like uh, well I'm sorry but you no. know yeah, yeah. You, you are the president of the wet blanket society I am well yeah. actually we thought about changing Post Carbon Institute's name to the wet blanket society yeah. okay of well, let's just bring that up to the next board meeting yeah. yeah we could do that we'll get an Indiegogo campaign for the organization and yeah see we'll, if we get we'll get like 12 cents yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll we, get like 12 we cents we need money for wet blankets nobody wants that <laughs> but so, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up as an extreme example of just, you know, somebody again brought it up to me recently. There are things like that. There are things like this idea that was bandied around. And by the way, these get a lot of media atten attention. Yeah, good this, news. This Solar Roads thing, yeah. you know, was in Washington Post and CNN and all these places. Not too long ago, there was a press release that was put out and got lots of coverage about this idea of capturing carbon dioxide out of the air and then turning that into gasoline, right? Okay, sure. And it's like... That sounds great, right? Yeah. We need gasoline and we need to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. Problem solved, right? But <laughs> when you actually do the math, you actually have an understanding of some of the physical, you know, physical yeah. properties involved yeah. here. It takes a lot of energy to do yeah, that. Yeah, thermodynamics of this stuff. Right. It's, a, it's a little problematic. But the reason I bring it up is because those are extreme examples of something that I think we encounter a lot, and that is 
that there is sort of this tendency, even for people that are really kind of deeply embedded in the whole idea of wanting to push for an energy transition, right. of kind of taking stuff at face value, you know, these these ideas that are being put out there. And and you look at the climate movement, folks in the climate movement, I would say that that I'm I consider myself part of that movement and I would consider a post carbon institute as an organization as part of that movement. But mm-hmm. a lot of folks in the climate movement are championing this idea of a of a transition to 100% renewable energy, which I share. We talked earlier about the challenges of our dependency on fossil fuels and not just because of climate change, but because of the fact that they're depleting, you know, we're going to have to transition away from, from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Yeah, so yeah. it's going to happen one way or one another. way or the other. Totally. So not against that. We, and and it'd be much better for us to actually manage that transition, try to do it as soon as, as quick, possible. Absolutely. Right. I mean, uh, the climate crisis is demanding that of us. So right. totally on the same page in terms of, of the, the goal and the vision for the future. But what we see a lot within the climate movement is sort of a grasping at, at plans and proposals that are being put out there that sound good on paper. Yeah, wishful thinking. Though, yeah, right? but when you actually run the numbers and you actually think about it in the, in the real world, maybe it won't come to fruition the way they're, that they're talking about. Yeah, and it, it's like the rah-rah optimism around the notion of, hey, the future will be like today, only better and run on better energy sources. Right. Yeah, and I don't want to pick on anybody, but I thought, you know, there's this... Um, you but you're going too. to. But you're yes, going to. Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, so I'm not going to name names here, okay? But here's here's somebody who is quoted, a you know, spokesperson, somebody who works for, for one of the, the climate organizations that's out there. And he basically said, hey, if you're at all technologically optimistic, the message from everyone in the clean energy world is this transition is going to be quicker and cheaper than anyone predicts. The hope is that we're sort of in the 1980s of computer technology when it comes to solar, and that countries, once they get the ball moving in the right direction, will figure out that they can transition even more quickly, right? And I, I probably was in that camp at one point. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I we want to believe this, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, folks like Mark Jacobson at Stanford University, he's, you know... You are uh, going to name names. Yeah. Well, I will <laughs> name him because I think Jacobson has been at the forefront of putting out these a set of solutions, these plans on paper that basically say we can transition 100% to renewable energy. And in fact, we'll save money. It won't be cost prohibitive to do this. And I find that, frankly, problematic because while I share, and I think we at PCI share the vision, I think it needs to be grounded in some sort of, of reality. Well, they'll think, just think about this. So electricity is only about 20%. Like when we use uh, when we use energy and we when we actually, you know, flip on a switch or whatever, only 20% of the energy in the US is delivered to us via electricity. Yeah. 20% so of our of our primary energy use is in the form of electricity. So the problem is is that almost everything proposal you see is like, "Oh, we're going to go 100% renewable." Like, well, let's imagine you say you go at 100% renewable electricity, which in and of itself would yeah. be amazing. That still leaves 80% of our energy system that you haven't even yeah. touched yet. And a lot of times, I don't even think that people, you know, when you, when you get these promotions, they almost just think about the electricity sector, right? Well, here's what, what I see a lot is actually people interchanging the word electricity with the word energy. Right. They, they see them as synonyms. And in fact, when California, you know, announced this landmark legislation that was sort of at the, I think it was at the end of 2018, talking about completely transitioning the power sector to renewable electricity, right? Yeah. Even the newspapers called it energy, right? Mm -hmm. So, so people, it's, it's understandable why people think of this as the the same challenge. But as you pointed out, Jason, you know, we're talking about a Herculean task to transition our electricity sector right. away from coal and natural gas and nuclear power if yeah. you want to transition that towards well, renewable energy sources. And that's only 20% of the challenge. Right. Could we go back for a second, though, to the, the guy you were talking about who said this is going to run like the computers development oh, like the 80s, in yeah. the 80s? Like, he's calling for exponentially better batteries over a yeah. 10 to 20 year period of time. I mean, that... Whatever. I, I am not a battery engineer. And they can about I, and I'm, double. I'm sure we can get better, yeah. but to do the exponential kind of speed. Well, I process, looked into this recently, and it, 
our today's batteries can probably maybe get at the most twice as good as they are today. In other words, if, if a battery of a certain size and weight can store X amount, it can maybe, maybe theoretically store two X. That's it. Well, there's not a whole lot left in terms of batteries getting a lot better than they already are. But again, it's understandable why people, they, they think about technology and their experience with technology is, is typically right. around computer technology and communications technology. And, and you think about Moore's Law, right? Moore's Law, Moore uh, was, mm-hmm. was one of the founders of, of Intel, and he basically came up with this hypothesis that they could, and they actually did do this, they could double the the processing speed of their chips every right. eighteen months, right? So right. you're getting exponential growth, right? And that, know? but that's kind of that's starting to run its course now. Even yeah, there's there's limitations to that as yeah. well. But we've experienced that growth. Right. I mean, my dad, you know, when I was a kid, my dad worked at Digital Equipment Corporation, nice. which was one of the largest computer companies in the world at the time. Nobody knows about it now. Yeah, right? now now your typical gaming outfit is probably bigger oh, yeah. than they are. And I remember Atari was big in those days. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, in fact, I, because my dad was buddies with one of the guys at Atari, we yeah. were one of the test families. So <laughs> I got to play Frogger before anybody else nice. got to play Frogger. But So you were you were hopping six pixels across a solar roadway <laughs> uh, long before exactly. anybody else was. Exactly. Oh, that's good. That's good. But but I remember going to visit my dad, you know, at, at, at DEC, and, like, the c- computer room was literally, like, a fucking warehouse, you know? <laughs> right, right. And the processing power of this enormous machine It was like was, the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark or something, walking down these hallways of you know, just massively stacked up computers, right? Yeah, and it was... And the processing power of that is, like, like a joke. You can't even compare it to anything. Yeah, it's have, not even a calculator. We have now. more than that in our in our room here with a couple of laptops. No, by orders of magnitude. <laughs> yeah. By orders of magnitude, right? Yeah. So so people we've experienced that in our lifetime was this this incredible right. exponential growth in computing power. But the way I always like to think of it and remind people is yeah, well, what about air travel, right? right? So we've had that faster. technology for <laughs> you know over 100 years. Yeah. Are we traveling that much faster now than we were traveling in the 1950s and 1960s? No, they decided it's really not good to go faster than the speed of sound. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, yeah, the Concorde <laughs> is out of commission now, right? It sucks when the wing falls off mid No, it's more <laughs> about like the, the sonic booms were so disruptive to people on the ground they had to stop. I mean, that's what it was. There's like right. consequences right. that they were like, oh, wait a but second. But there are even physical limitations in terms of our ability but the, to the altitude has more. exponentially increased. Oh, I mean, totally. Now you fly above the height of the sun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which gets you there much faster. Well, but, but I think it's a good point is that people take this one sector, this one example of technological innovation, and they say, well, we can do this for everything. And it's like, no, this was... This was one of those amazing things that we're able to take these transistors and and then make them smaller, smaller. And now we're coming to the point where you can't fit atoms any closer together. Right. Right. Like, yeah. sorry, there's only so much space. You can't do it. And, and, and energy is a totally different matter. Right. But as we've talked about before, our literacy around energy is pretty low in this country. And it's understandable. The more concerned you are about these issues the more you want to believe that there is is a solution to them. We also, I will say, yeah. we also encounter folks who are kind of like on the complete opposite side. I mean, I don't sure. deal a lot with fossil fuel advocates, you know. Abiotic uh, oil kind of stuff. Lobbyists yeah. and, you know, uh, <laughs> the the associations. They're, they're not people that we buddy-buddy with very often. So I'm not, I'm not talking about people who come from the fossil fuel sector so much. But there are folks who... Because I think they are more grounded in in an energy realism or an understanding of the properties of energy, look askance, you know, at, at some of these plans or proposals that are that are being put out there. They kind of say, look, we can completely substitute all the energy that we're currently consuming from fossil fuels and do it with renewable energy. So we hear from folks as well who are like. Ah, oh, renewable energy. It's a complete joke. There's no possibility oh, here. Oh, that's the wet know. mattress society. <laughs> that's the wet mattress society. Yeah. yeah. And we've been seeing this for years and and kind of have felt ourselves caught a little bit in between these these two narratives about this this energy transition. So actually a couple of years ago, we decided, you know, we need to actually do a really focused 
analysis and look at this thing. So we asked our, our senior fellow, Richard Heinberg, and one of our energy fellows, a guy named David Fridley, he works at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, one of the, the big labs in the United States, who's probably the smartest guy I know, no offense to anybody else around energy issues, to sort of look at this challenge, right? And and to try to do it in a realistic way, you know, understanding the fact that if we say we have this shared goal of, of transitioning to 100% renewable energy, how do we get there? What does that sort of look like? And when they took on that project, I think that the first place that they started, which is not what we see typically in other places, is actually looking at how we're using energy, right? So there's this famous, well, not famous, okay, famous <laughs> in our geeky energy cir- circles, Sankey, what's called a Sankey diagram. I love that. That's being put out. You know, <laughs> yeah. Lawrence Livermore, I think, has one. And um, and that basically shows the flow of energy through our like in- industrial system. The systems, entire economy, you know? right, yeah. yeah. And, Sectors. And on the left side of that chart, Right, you could sort of see the the inputs of that. You know, that's the fossil fuel inputs and and the other inputs. Hydroelectric. And, and at the very end of it is are the final end uses of it. Right. Okay. And most of these plans, Mark Jacobson, as I mentioned from Stanford and others, really look at the far left side. That's the supply side, and they're looking at well, how do we just transition all of this energy over here from fossil fuels to renewable? And so. What Richard and David did instead was actually start on the right side of the diagram, which is how we're using energy. Because we actually have a lot of losses. We have a tremendous amount of loss in that transformation of the primary energy that we're getting out of the ground through fossil fuels to the end use when you're turning on the coffee pot. Right. You know, well, and that's house. smart too, because that's also what you're doing in society. That's the, and you're thinking about how to keep doing what you're doing in society, but powered by something else. Yeah, and um, and so I think that was something that was that was uh, an important thing that, that that we did in in this project that they did. The other thing was just just start out by trying to understand how much energy we're using right now. And the world right now consumes about a hundred billion barrels of oil equivalent. Right? It's not all in oil, but if you if you equate it to barrels of oil, then you take a, so many lumps of coal equal a barrel yeah, of oil, exactly. Okay, or even renewable energy. So one hundred billion barrels of yeah, oil per year yeah. is what we're consuming, right? Right. And remember we had talked before about like if you try to actually convert the amount of energy, useful energy in a barrel of oil, and you try to do that the same amount of work with human labor. Do eleven years. Eleven years. Yeah. yeah we that's about that's in our energy literacy episode. Yes, if, I love if, that if you episode. miss that one, go back to it. Right. So so keep that that number number in mind. Eleven years. Okay. Simple so, uh, math. So hundred billion times eleven years. Times eleven years. One point one trillion years of human labor a year <laughs> that we're consuming in energy. I, don't, I have no clue what that means. It, it, it means a it's lot. It's inconceivable, right? Yeah. So the universe isn't that old. <laughs> no, the universe not even is not close. that old. Um, so in 85% of that energy still comes from fossil fuels, right? Now, we've heard a lot about positive signs coming from the renewable energy sector, right? Prices have come down for solar. Yeah. You know, prices have come down for wind. Um, you know, we've seen oh, really the, big growth rates. People always talk to you about uh, it's exponentially increasing. No worries. It's going gonna, it's gonna to overshadow fossil fuels in no time. Just stop. Stop using fossil fuels. Stop investing in them. Renewables are coming on. Right. But let's let's keep this in perspective so we understand what's in front of us in terms of this challenge, right? right? About 4% of, our, of the energy that we're consuming every year globally, of that 100 billion barrels of oil equivalent, is in the form of renewable energy. We're ta- I'm talking about solar and wind. Sure. I'm not, not including hydro there, which is really limited in terms of our capacity to grow. Right. And there's some environmental questions about right. it. So 4%, right? Yeah. Even with all that tremendous growth we're seeing, we're actually still seeing that we're adding more fossil fuels right. every year than we are adding renewable energy. So we're still falling behind, right. yeah. even with the, the, the growth that we've seen. With, with oh, totally. Like if, you grow, if you're at 4% and you grow at 20% a year, you might be at 5% in three years. Right. But, but still, your total amount of energy produced is not that large. It, whereas if you're, if you're at a... 1.2 gigawatts or whatever. <laughs> 1.21 gigawatts now, from Back to the Future. If you're a big number, but you only grow by a small amount, right? 
the, the amount you grow in terms of huge, huge, huge number of gigawatts. Jig- that's that's jig- a lot of gigawatts. Addition. Untold gigawatts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that, I mean, that's the problem we're having is that we're growing, we're growing our fossil fuels at maybe only a few percent a year and we're growing renewables at like 20%, but it's a completely different scale of what you're starting from. Well, on the plus side, we know there's a lot of chance to improve, right? There's a lot of opportunity to get renewables powering a lot more than what they are now. And and I think, I mean, so yeah. so when Richard and David kind of did this project for Our Renewable Future, that's the name of the, the book that we ended up publishing that they wrote. It's also the website we put up, which actually has a book up for free. You know, they, they talked about the fact that, okay, this is a huge enormous undertaking that we're dealing with Mm -hmm. the consequences are are tremendous the need and urgency is is as real as it gets and there are some opportunities there right there are there challenges and i think that it's worth with outlining those challenges but when we think about the opportunities one of the things as i mentioned is that there's a lot of losses in in the energy system right now just a tremendous amount of loss and electricity happens to be more efficient than other forms, right? Yeah. And so, and people talk a lot about this, for example, when it comes to like thinking about electric vehicles for, you know, yeah. they're, it's, it's they're more much efficient more for, efficient. For motor systems, yeah. but not necessarily for heating systems. Right. So it also depends what your use is. That's true. Yeah. But I think that they did come down squarely in the camp of saying we should electrify as much as we possibly can, mm-hmm. you know, and, and there are examples of that where it makes sense to try to do that around transport, yeah. where it makes sense to do that around manufacturing of things. Like, uh, like in roadways, you should electrify roads. Oh, that's exactly <laughs> what um, And, you know, things like even cooking, right? And one of the things that, that, that they talked about in the book is, is electrifying cooking, you know, mm-hmm. instead of having gas stoves, having yeah. ele- electric it, stoves. You and you, you put a big pole on top of your house and you put your meal up there and wait for lightning to strike it, right? Or you could actually do what some people do, which is actually have these solar, passive solar cookers, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, if you live in a place where there's sunlight, you could put it in like a little tiny greenhouse and cook your food that way. People do it. It's actually pretty cool. I've done yeah. it myself. So there, there are definitely opportunities there, and we know that we got to do this. It's not a question of whether we should do it or not, but we need to be realistic about some of the challenges. So I thought it'd be worth reminding folks what those challenges are. And in the, in, in the book, they basically outlined six key challenges. And I'm just going to like summarize those really quickly, right? The first one is intermittency, okay? And that's the fact that the sun doesn't always shine. Right. Well, how the hell are you going to watch your YouTube videos all night long when the sun isn't shining? Well, you got to put solar panels on the moon. Yeah. Well, I, I'm thinking lunar panels. Yeah. Right. Can we can we uh, get an Indiegogo going for yeah, lunar let's panels? Let's do that as one long cable to run from those panels to your house. No, no, so you it's, can, it's all going to be wireless. Oh, well, well this wireless. is. I mean, this is five G, baby. I mean, this is where you know. Then this, okay, batteries, right? Batteries. We just use. We'll yeah. just store excess in the day with batteries. But that's there gets. There's a lot of problems with that, and that batteries aren't actually that energy dense, right? So this gets to the problem of energy density, which is another. Uh, another issue and that liquid fuels by contrast the stuff we're used to like diesel and gasoline and kerosene they're incredible so the energy density means they they contain a lot of usable energy in space and weight right right? small amount of material packs a lot of punch exactly yeah and and so that actually gets to you you just talked about it jason when the the second thing that they pointed out was the liquid fuels problem Right. right hard to replace liquid fuels with renewable stuff yeah, I mean, you think about it from the st- uh, the standpoint of transport, you know. So, for example, you think about air travel, right? right? right. I mean, batteries are heavy, right? right? They're really heavy, and to be able to pack as much energy as you need, can you actually do that on a 747? Well, the you know, lithium, jet? they're not even allowed to bring lithiums on. Right, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, people have talked about, you know, things like cryogenic hydrogen. That's one of the things that Mark Jacobson, pull, you know, pulls out of, of his hat as a solution for the air travel problem. It doesn't exist, well, what right? Is it again? Cryogenic hydrogen. You're, cryogenic you're, hydrogen. You're, you're, uh, your wings have to be negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I, I thought maybe you were talking about like you freeze all the passengers. Uh, and then you can you fly can around too. for months. They don't care. They don't you, can care. Do, you can fly by hot Actually, air Actually, you're balloon. not even flying them anymore. You're just taking them by stagecoach. Yeah, by but wheel, they don't know. wheelbarrow, right? Uh, just exactly. push you across. Right. 
Um, you know, another one that they talk about is that we use fossil fuels for other things. You know, sure. we're not just using them for electricity production, for example, or as a, as a transport. I got fuel. one thing to say for you, young man. What's that? Plastics. Plastics. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, we need more straws. <laughs> we we use them in all kinds of petroleum byproducts, right? In fact, I mean, our if you just look around your house, you yeah, know, look at your hair today. It's my so hair good. is full of plastic. <laughs> exactly. Right. Actually, it's yeah. scary to think about probably how much plastic is in my body, you know. But yeah. but uh, you know, and uh, maybe a more pressing or telling example of that because maybe we don't need you know, everyone to buy a new plastic comb and whatever the hell else we buy it all the time or Coke in a plastic bottle. But they actually use fossil fuels for things like making steel. Right. right, it's a direct input into making steel, and we use a shit ton of steel. Right, or, uh, we use making, steel for electric vehicles. We're making oh, well, fertilizer. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and 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 pesticides, and just the lubricants, for example. I mean, right, incredible how important lubricants are, so the steel doesn't like grind on each other. Yeah, yeah and, I, I was gonna say roads, but the solar freaking roads don't have to be made <laughs> that's right. out of that. Yeah, asphalt. but it's true, asphalt. I mean, that is that's a petroleum byproduct. It, you you talked about lubricants, Jason, and it used to be. I actually looked into this. How do people used to lubricate like bicycles, for example? Oh, thank God. That's not where I thought you were going. <laughs> I'm not going there, dude. <laughs> thank God. No, bicycle travel, right? Yeah, I mean, sure. before we had car transport like and we were doing a lot. Like, no, like you, had to, you had to cut open your ankle and bleed on the chain. That was. <laughs> they actually would take fat. They would re- yeah. take rendered fat, you sure. know, and they would basically melt it onto the, the chain of the bicycle. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. a sea lion for every family. As there, as there are riding their bicycle. It's like, you know, lard or tallow. Cook with it or lubricate with it. Right. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. All of the above, baby. Yeah. Yeah, so so there's intermittency, there's the liquid fuels problem, there's other uses of fossil fuels. The fourth one, I remember this one cuz uh, it's the density of energy collection. And the reason I remember it is I recently was helping someone move and we were driving through the desert, and I, I felt like a moth drawn to the flame. There was this just amazing light in the sky. And I'm like, what the hell is that? And it was one of these new solar power plants. So it had a tower with this... Uh, oh, it was oh, concentrated the molten, the molten solar. salt yeah. reactor. Yeah. yeah, so there's like thousands of mirrors strewn yes. out all over the ground, all pointing at the top of this tower, and the light bounces off the mirrors and it melts the salt up on top of this tower and it emits this really bright light. And it was amazing to me like how big the footprint of this place was. And it's actually cool. If you go on Google Earth and look for these things, these concentrated solar power plants, you can see, wow, that is a large amount of space needed to collect the energy, which doesn't turn out to be that much. Yeah. And then what's interesting is that you're talking about, of course, you're going to put this in a desert where you're Almost every day, you're going to have great amount of sun. Right. But a, a lot of times, where you want to use the energy is somewhere else. Right. right. And so there's always a loss. Not, not too much need to. We heat don't want to be living right in there. the desert right no. next to one of those. So, like, if you want to grow crops, you have you need water, and that's not the desert so much, unless you're pumping out ancient aquifers and whatever. We won't get into that. But this is a problem. Then is that you know the location where maybe the best for renewables is not necessarily the location where people are actually living and doing work. Right. <laughs> you don't want to live in the windiest place on earth. Is <laughs> what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So location is is kind of the fifth challenge that they talked about. And and as you said, you you place these these panels or the wind turbines far from where people are, and then you got losses over over transmission, transmission lines. lines, right? Yeah, it's just n- the nature of the beast, right? And then the last one, which is really in some ways a summation of of these different challenges, and that is that at the end of the day, it's unlikely that we're going to be using as much energy. As we currently consume. If we're getting 100% off of fossil fuels and going completely to renewable energy sources, and, and nuclear, by the way, is not part of this, this conversation right now. That's a whole other you know, ball of wax. But um, it was very difficult after having done this analysis to see how we could possibly be using the same amount of energy as, as we're currently consuming. Once fossil, fossil fuels, fuels start declining, well, renewables won't compensate. Yeah. Well, let's let's take a look at that for a second because we're not talking about using the same amount of energy. We're talking always about growing. Yes. Uh, growing the size of the economy, 
growing the amount of energy that flows through the economy. So we're, we're always looking at this exponential growth. So, I mean, that's got to change too, right? That's true. Yeah, because the assumption is not, I mean, I don't think people think about it very much, but but we keep wanting and expecting our economies to grow. And there's been a correlation, a very strong correlation between economic growth and energy, energy growth. Yeah. yeah, it's almost one to one. Well, we've got yeah. this colleague, a physicist named Tom Murphy, who's uh, he actually had a, a blog called Do the Math. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it, it was, it was a fantastic yeah. blog. Yeah. And not not lazy <laughs> about doing some math. But he, he looked at this exponential growth. And so he said, OK, let's say we, we grow energy use at 2.3 percent a year. OK. okay? which is less than what our historical rate's been more like 2.9%. We said, okay, 2.3% a year, and we're going to do this with all renewable energy. And let's just make a wacky assumption that the solar, we're going to do it with solar panels, and the solar panels are going to be 100% efficient. Which is impossible. Yeah, I mean, no, no loss. We're getting like 20%, you know, that's good performance right now. But let, let's just, let's just go ahead and run with that assumption. And he found that uh, you know you just do it's this very simple math. You you run the numbers, and in four hundred years' time, we'll have to cover every square inch of the planet, including the oceans, in solar <laughs> right. panels to generate that amount of electricity. And just to <laughs> just to put that in perspective, four hundred years can sound like a lot, but like I think the city of Santa Fe is older than that. Oh yeah, right? you know, yeah. I mean, it's really not that no. that much time. Yeah, you can but find... of course, you run into trouble way before then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, true. Yeah. Floating. You mean we're not going to cover the entire surface of the Earth <laughs> with solar, solar panels? Well, you know, the the crazy thing though is he, he. I really love what he did in his analysis. He took it a, another level further. You know, because people are always going to come and say, "Well, what if we discover fusion power right, right. or whatever, or, or invent something that that can put out more?" And he said that uh, he just ran that on. Okay, if you exponentially grow the amount of energy that we're using on the Earth. It only takes you 1,400 years until the heat that you're generating is equivalent to the sun. Yeah. So, so here on Earth, it's going to be as hot as the sun if you exponentially grow energy use at 2.3%. Just because of waste heat, right? Which is true for no matter what form of energy yeah, you have. There's right. a certain amount matter. of heat that gets... That it's gets, imperfect. You know, Second yeah. law of thermodynamics. Yeah. And, yeah. Turns into heat. Yeah. So good luck with uh, keeping this growth going. <laughs> So, you know, here, here are some of the challenges, right? We published this book sort of trying to take a realistic look at, at this, at the opportunities and challenges of this, of this transition. What's fascinating to me really has to do with the psychology of why people, like the guy that, that had emailed me about the solar roadways, you know, and, and, and the other folks that we encounter a lot, like why do they fall either into this belief system that uh, takes some of this technological wizardry or these these numbers that people run at face value or the folks that are just completely outright dismissive. Like what leads people into this kind of just trust that, that this transition is going to happen? It's just a political problem. We hear this right. all the time. Yeah. The technology has been solved. There's more sunlight that hits the earth Every you know, in a right. second than we could possibly consume in a year. Right. This is just a political problem. It's not a technological problem. So what is it about people that leads them to sort of just take that at face value when the stakes are so high? I think there's a lot to it. I mean, remember uh, good old scowling Dick Cheney and his, you know, non-negotiable way of life. The American life is, uh, lifestyle is non-negotiable. That's one of the most famous things the guy said. And, and people feel that way. They're like, yes. no, you're not going to tell me that I can't have whatever it is I'm accustomed to, that I can't have more that I'm accustomed to. And I think people are tied to this notion of continuously increasing consumption. I totally. And so if you're a, say you're a Stanford professor or you're a, an activist who's trying to influence a political system, they can't ever go to the political leadership and say, we're going to have less in the future. We're going we're gonna to have less energy. We're going to do less work. People are going to be materially less wealthy. And so if that becomes a conversation you can never have, then the sort of, the sort of calisthenics or gymnastics or contortions you have to go through then 
to try to make up some absurd story that fits the non-negotiable way of life, it just leads to one crazy absurdity after another. Yeah, I think that we're, and it's totally understandable, here we are faced with this existential dire threat of climate change. And for people who are concerned about that issue, to try to mobilize people to address it without being able to you know, promise them a future yeah. that doesn't require sacrifice or using energy substantially differently than we currently use it right. or using less of it right. feels like it's a really hard sell. You know, as it is here, you know, uh, talking about the fact that we can transition, we have all the technology we possibly need, we can totally afford it. It's going to create all these jobs, you know, and we're seeing that with the Green New Deal right now. Yeah. Even with that positive vision, there's a lot of resistance, right. right? So if you came to people and you said, realistically, we're going to need to be using 10% of the energy that we currently consume, right. you know, and especially if you think of it from the standpoint, from an equity standpoint, yeah. right? Because we in the West consume a tremendous amount of energy. I mean, uh, I think in a previous episode, we had talked about the fact that the average American consumes something like 50 barrels of oil yeah. a year, right? right. And th- a lot of the world is not no. even close to that, no, right? right? They're they're energy poor. And in fact, they could benefit tremendously from infrastructure investments, from bringing modern energy right. in, into, the, into their lives. They would materially benefit. So if we said... We're not going to be able to continue to grow energy demand globally, right? And in fact, we need to curtail it. We're going to need to reduce how much energy we consume. And we also need to do that with equitable distribution so that folks who are currently hardly consuming energy, any energy, uh, have the opportunity to consume more. That means those of us, you know, like the three of us sitting here, have to consume even less energy, right. you know? That is a tough, That's tough That's a tough sell. platform. Yeah. Good yeah. luck, good I, luck, president, yeah, candidate. Yeah. 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 You're, you're now the new president of the wet blanket society. Right, that's, <laughs> that's why I'm not running I, for office anymore. I also soon. have to say that it's an energy literacy problem too, right? I mean, we talk, we have a whole episode on that, but people don't know much about it, and then they tend to just believe yeah, the experts. Mark Jacobsons. Sure. You know, the, there's the whole idea of stovepiping in academia where you got these people who know their topic and you tend to not question them on it because whatever i haven't i don't have a yeah. phd in that so. when i go to the dentist i don't like argue about my teeth <laughs> right. that's right <laughs> right you you tend to believe they know what they're doing yeah, yeah. but i will say jason has no teeth by the way <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> this is why this is what happens when you argue with your dentist yeah. right they're wooden it's right. fine right this is here's what i will say about this though there are folks in academia, there are experts in the energy sector that have a realistic sense of what this challenge is, and they're not listened to very often, no. right? I mean, it's it's incumbent on all of us to to scratch beneath the surface. It's definitely incumbent upon media, you know? Right. So you see the media crowing all the time about this newfangled this and newfangled yes. that, you know, without really doing any reality check, kicking the tires, as it yeah. were. And they don't have to go very far to talk to people that, that have no. dedicated their lives to energy systems to get a more realistic sense. Well, you know? one of those academics that I think does understand some of this, or at least has an insight that's really worth exploring. And we explored this in our car culture episode is Marvin Harris and his cultural materialism. You remember that was about the idea that whatever infrastructure you've got, that really informs the belief system of your whole culture. Right. right? And we are in this, this infrastructure that is entirely built and fueled with oil and coal and natural gas and so our belief system has gotten kind of warped. We believe that we have essentially unlimited power right at our fingertips all the time. Hardly anybody, when they flip the light switch or turn on the computer, thinks about, why is this thing working? There's a fire somewhere being burned for you. Yeah. yeah. That's what a, it is. A literal fire. Literally, yes. Yeah. No, is that true in terms of the, the fact that we, we've been born into a world where there are all these advances happening and a growth that's happening and consumption and material, you know, wealth and all these things as a result of the, the properties of fossil fuels. 
they also have certain characteristics to them, right? So, you know, we built roads <laughs> yeah. and we, we built cars and airplanes and all these other things that we've done because we've had, the, we had this temporary abundance of fossil fuels. We had this unique property. Like you're talking, Jason, about the, the density, the properties of them, the trans, mm-hmm. transportability of fossil fuels, right? So because we live in this infrastructure that was built on fossil fuels, we get stuck in thinking, well, the way we can get around is going to be car still, Right. It's just going to be electric, right? right so right. we're still going to have these roads. We're still going to be flying on airplanes. We're still going to be doing all the things that we're currently doing. Yeah. It's just going to be we'll swap quote out. unquote green or clean, you know. Yeah. And and you're right. I mean, I think it's a really good point to bring that up because to me, the big takeaway here is we are undertaking an energy transition. We're going through one right now. We've gone through energy transitions in in human history in the past. We've we've talked about that before. You know, profound transformations and and transitions. Those have all been additive in the past, right? And now we're in a situation where we're needing to replace and substitute. We need to take away 85%. Yes, we've never done that before. Of the source of our energy and replace it with something that's completely different that doesn't have the ability to do in quite the same way, right? And so that is this enormous challenge. We are going to do it. We don't have a choice right. one way or the other. But this transition is going to be as much about a change in our expectations. It's going to be a, 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 as much about a change in how we're using energy and how we live as it is about the sources of that energy. And in yeah. fact, the more we change our relationship with energy, how we're using it, we actually think about the first step. You go and you ask a solar contractor to come to your house to install solar panels on your house. If they are worth anything at all, the first thing they're going to do is look at how you're using energy and think about how to make it more efficient. Yeah, use right? less actually. Yeah. So that you're don't need X number of solar panels, right? So the first thing that we need to do is look at how we're using energy, how much of it we're using and reduce that so that we can actually achieve this transition in a way where we can share it equitably and we can live happy and healthy lives and are not trying to perform a magic trick. Right. Yeah, it seems like that will come up over and over again. We've got to change our expectations. And I, I, I know you've talked about how hard it is to sell this politically, but there's a, there's, there's a camaraderie in sacrifice. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the idea that I'm going to use less so that, one, I'm not wrecking the climate or, or causing mayhem, but two, that maybe somebody else has a chance to use more who hasn't ever had that chance. And not even just people, you know, if we think about equitable distribution of, of energy, for example, now, think about future generations. You guys are yeah. sounding really mature right now and like, like very responsible. Uh, should we crack a fart joke now? Is that <laughs> <laughs> if we could only harness that as a form of energy. So is that the uh, is that your is that your basic call to action that we we need to consume less? And, yeah, and we get used to that idea. Yeah, we need to be thinking about about how we're using energy, and always be thinking about conservation first. I, I don't think so, man. Solar freaking roads, <laughs> bro. All right, when they're invented, I'll see you out there. Right. <laughs> Yeah, right, I'm going to Can I fly a magic te- No, I don't want to fly it. I want to drive it on the solar road, the magic Tesla delivered to me by Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. <laughs> Good yeah, luck. I'm not I'm not holding my breath for that. <laughs> That's our show. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to the podcast and while you're at it, rate or review it at iTunes. That really helps get in front of more people. To learn more, visit postcarbon.org slash crazy town. And if you want to actually learn something instead of listening to us bozos, you should check out Post Carbon Institute's Think Resilience course. It's four hours, 20 bucks, and will seriously change the way you see the world. Catch you next time on the mean streets at Crazy Town. Today's show is brought to uh, our listeners by Shareflush. You guys heard of this? No. Yeah. no what's up? Oh, gosh. Um, well, you know, you, you're going through a city and you're like, you need to go urgently. But you Oh, can't you're talking fu- about like doing number one or number yeah. two? Yeah, one of those, either, both. It's a constant state for me. And there's public bathrooms are pretty hard to find, but the sharing economy has an answer. You just download the Share Flush app, and if you need to unloose the caboose, 
you can get turn by turn directions to the nearest share flush host. This is I am never going to poop in my own house again. It's you, always going to be in someone else's house. You can do that. There are bidets. There are seat warmers. I mean, there are some well, fancy stuff. So out is there, there like you know how like Lyft or like Uber they've got like like more deluxe yes you know cars that you it can get so you might pay more for like a super fancy bathroom <laughs> yes well, Do, can you pay to have somebody else wipe your ass for you um well there is another app for that <laughs> i don't want to get into it can you can you poop on like a rug or something is it or is it always a toilet <laughs> um look why don't you just download the app and you can see what kind of share flush uh, a host or in your neighborhood. Uh, I, I'm going to go do that. Do it. Share flush. Hey. We're the sharing economy. I was doing it right when you were talking. <laughs> it's nature's Pooping call. or downloading the app? Both. Both, yeah. <laughs>